Do you guys remember how when I started working on this set, I hoped that I would not have to go anywhere near that monstrous tuner other than to maybe clean it, chuck some tubes? Well, <laughs> I now know more about a Zenith tuner than I ever wanted to. <laughs> I have gone over that thing from stem to stern, checked the individual modules, the components on the modules, the voltages, the resistances, the continuity through the coils. Can't find any problems. Ah, so, uh, coincidentally, I saw this guy come up for sale on eBay. It is a uh, telematic. I think it's the same outfit that makes some of those CRC uh, substitutors. Um, it's a tuner substitutor. Uh, you disconnect the antenna or your signal from your TV and you feed it into this and you take the output of this IF and you inject that into your set. And then you can choose your channel here, this variable gain. I'm not sure what the switch does. It might be power. Uh, it basically does the same thing as this newfangled VG91 up on top there. But this is the old school way to do it where you use an actual broadcast signal as your signal source. But this will substitute for that. And it does the 44 megahertz IF. Uh, sketchy info about this box. I just got uh, one sheet of paper with it, but what, what I find puzzling is I found some original articles and ads for this, and they show it being battery powered by two 9 volt batteries. But this clearly has a power cord, and it looks like that's probably original. So I'm curious do I have a variation that uh, has a power supply built in? This solid state came out around. Well, late 60s, 1970s, something like that. Nice condition. Uh, however, as I was getting set to start playing around with that, I noticed something. Serendipity. Thank God. I uh, wanted to fire, I fired up my scope. I was going to poke around and check some signals on the various IF stages. So I powered the set back up. I'll get up to my VG91. Blasting the highest level output it can into channel 3 on the tuner. I have nothing now. Nothing at all. Ah, uh, but then, thank goodness, I noticed something didn't look right in the tuner. It's hard to tell with all these bright lights on. So let me reduce it a bit. Well, one of the tubes isn't lit up. This guy. Maybe it's a little too dark. That is the 6C4. That's a local oscillator this guy. Now, it's a series strung set. How is that possible? Because everything, every, all the other tubes are lit. Not all the tubes are part of the series string. Particularly three of the tubes and the tuner and a few of the others. There is a tap off the power transformer that's used for B+. Plus. There's like an auto former tap or something like that. Some of the tubes are actually powered from a transformer. They're not part of the series string. Therefore, it is possible for this tube to not be lit up, but the set operate. Ah, and I think if we hearken back to when I first started working on this, first powered it up, I had some issues with this, and I was wiggling tubes, or I think the tubes were in the wrong sockets or something like that, and then suddenly it started working. And guess what? I pull this tube out a little, and get that filament glowing. That's a high-quality ceramic porcelain-type socket, but... It's dirty or bad connections, and look at that. Not only do we now have our signal coming back through, it's coming through nice and strong and clean. And turn the brightness down a little. So I think I finally, finally, finally solved the problem. I can turn things down a bit. Have the AGC cranked all the way up, turn the brightness down. Notice no speckles, no noise. So, prior to this, I think the tube filament was working, but we had a flaky connection on one of the other tube elements. Let's try a different pattern here. Uh, that's another issue I want to address. Now that I think this is working, as horizontal linearity is pretty bad, pretty miserable. There are some settings for that. In fact, there's a bunch of settings I need to go through. 
There's the uh, good old bandwidth test, and it's a pretty good bandwidth. Take the fine tuning a little. I see a little more definition on the far right side, but it is, it's not too bad. Let's try an actual video signal now. Is everybody ready to see some crystal clear video coming out of this screen? I know I am. So, the usual over there converter box going into channel 3. <laughs> oh, so much better, so much better. Fine, Ali. Too much time on this. So let that be a lesson to you about uh, or to everyone working on these finicky old vintage sets. Uh, trust nothing. <laughs> assume nothing. Or assume or assume that anything could be bad. And the older, the more oddball the set is the more finicky uh, they're likely to be. So now I can go through all the stuff. It looks like the vertical linearity is a little bit off. The horizontal hold took a, little, took a little bit of time to kick in. Focus needs a tad bit of tweaking, but otherwise that, this is what <laughs> the picture is supposed to look like on a, TV, on a TV of this vintage. Excuse me. Huh. So what do I do about that socket? The oxit um, on the two pins Slide the tube in and out a bunch of times. Uh, worst case scenario, replace it, which might be real tricky to do. There's one other thing I want to show you about this tuner that I have no explanation for, but really odd. This is the socket. It's giving me trouble, so I'm going to get in there and clean it well. The tube looks pretty good, but maybe I'll pull out another... 6C4, get a new old stock one. There's a lot of minor things I need to take care of. I'm missing a tube shield on that and a couple of the other tubes. Deal with all that now, but this is what I wanted to show you. Underneath this cover, you get access to the uh, tuner sections for each channel. There's a maintenance hatch so you can clean contacts or replace the strips if needed. So sort of similar to the Sark's Tarzian tuner, the sets like Admirals use, but this is <laughs> a little bit larger. Um, one's missing. I don't know if it's missing or if that's supposed to be open. Well, I guess it's supposed to be open because there, there is a dead spot on the tuner. And that's what that corresponds to. So this would be channel 3, I do believe. This is what I was digging in here and checking for all continuity, all these contacts. But check out the back side of this plate. It has been deeply scored. It's supposed to lock in down below and a couple screws up top and this little bit of metal here to secure the coax. That's the output of the tuner. If you put it in like it looks like it's supposed to, those contacts, switch contacts, rub against the plate badly. I don't think it's supposed to be like that. But I suspect it was like that for a very long time. This thing is built like a tank. Nothing moves. There's no adjustments. There's no, there aren't any slotted openings in this metal so you can move stuff around. I don't know what the deal is. So instead of putting it into these, I just put it on the outside and tighten it down so that it doesn't rub. Uh, I have no explanation for that, <laughs> of how that could have come to be, other than the manufacturing defect from when the set was made. Luckily, it hasn't destroyed these contacts, um, but that's why I was focusing so much attention on this kind of stuff when I discovered this, or some of the you know, workings of the tuner. It never occurred to me. It could be something as benign, something as simple as a bad tube socket or a dirty connection. Well, I'm starting to make the adjustments, and it's like with everything else, Zenith had to do things a little bit their own way. So the horizontal 
uh, frequency control is up here. Kind of makes sense because it's next to the horizontal hold control. I'm having to put it near one extreme to get the horizontal lock. So I want to put this control in the center of its rotation and adjust this coil so we can get a lock in the middle. And there's a hole in the front and you put a slotted tool and you adjust the slug on that. Usually they're at the back of the set, but in this case they're in the front. With control, it's a nifty little slide lever through the back here. They have a slot. Slide it up and down. That actually moves a slug and that coil. So I'll put it with the width. And the drive control is usually a variable cap, but in this case it's a potentiometer. So I need to adjust the width and the drive to try to get good linearity and uh, adjust this guy so I get horizontal lock in the center of the horizontal hold control and tweak the height and linearity which are these two controls and they'll take care of the majority of the adjustments. The last one I'm not sure about is focus. I'm more accustomed to sets of this vintage using electromagnet for the focus coil in which case you have a rheostat and you vary the current through the coil to adjust the focus. This is a permanent magnet. From what I read you move this around to center the picture, which definitely does work. But to focus, you're supposed to be able to do something with this. This is knurled, so it sure seems like, oh, it does turn. Boy, it was just so stiff. I couldn't get it to turn earlier. Ah, it's threaded. Interesting. I've seen some where there's kind of Metal. I've seen some where there's a metal sleeve like this, but you just manually slide it in and out. I've never seen one with... But that, that's fancy. <laughs> that is a threaded... That's a machine brass, I think. That's threaded into the permanent magnet, and this will affect the magnetic field a little bit. So you can adjust the strength of the magnetic field of the permanent magnet by sliding or screwing in or in or out this... Uh, Brass or bronze? It's probably brass. Interesting. Interesting arrangement. Okay, so I get to do all that stuff while the set's turned on and not shock myself again. Okay, let's do horizontal hold first. People have asked me to show how you set up a set, so I'll go through it a bit. Now, I already blindly tried adjusting that coil, and I clearly messed it up so I can't get a lock at all. Every set is so different, that's why I really uh, don't talk about this much. The SAMS uh, PhotoFact has a pretty good uh, condensed uh, setup instructions on the back page. It's where they usually put it on the back cover, or somewhere towards the back. There we go, well, out the way. That's better. Now I can put the horizontal hold through its entire range of motion and I never lose lock and it's nice and vertical in the middle. That's that's good to see. Usually there's a little bit of twisting here and there and sets, but that's really nice. So the horizontal linearity, notice the squares are a bit wider here and they get scrunched on that side. That's what I want to try tackling. So well, let's do the focus first. So it's some I've noticed the focus has been a bit off for quite a while now, but I wasn't sure how to do anything about it. So let's turn the brightness down a little bit. And uh, let's try maybe a different test pattern. That? Yeah, let's try that. And uh, rotating out. Well, oh, it's, <laughs> no, it's not. It's definitely having an effect on the, it's moving the picture in a little bit, but it's definitely gotten blurry, so we want to go in. You see, whenever you mess with these magnetic fields, everything interacts with everything else. The, uh, the ion trap magnet, the, uh, so this is the centering control here, so I move stuff all around. And when you get the magnetic field too, too extreme, get that shadow here. It means the electron beam is actually hitting the, that's the side of the neck. It's not uh, getting all the way to the front. So we definitely don't want that. Mm, it's a little too low. 
It's not an easy, I'm not crazy about these mechanical adjusters. A little, a little finicky. Something like that. But also this whole plate is mounted on four springs with screws. I think they'd be screw the entire plate in. So it's, I have that uh, brass assembly screwed in as tight as it goes. And now I'm moving the iron trap around. <laughs> you can spend a lot of time on this. Eh. Alright, let's try that horizontal drive. This is uh, akin to the efficiency coil in a color set. So it's not just that you're adjusting the linearity, you're also trying to minimize or maximize the efficiency of the flyback circuit. And generally that happens when everything looks right. That's better. So the drive from the center of the screen to the right, that's the flyback. The left side to the center is the damper. So the drive control should really mostly have an effect on the right side of the screen. And yeah. Something a bit like that. There's a case where a mirror comes in handy because I'm having to reach all the way around to the back of the set to adjust that. Let's try that with slide control now, see what that does. Oh wow, that is awesome. <laughs> On most sets, the width control, there's a coil with a threaded shaft and it has minimal effect from one extreme to the other. Maybe it'll vary the width 5-10%, but boy this, this is dramatic. So, I will be playing around with this stuff and trying to get everything as good as I can with the screen geometry. This is the height and the linearity. I'm not sure which is which. They both kind of do the same thing. <laughs> and then it starts rolling. Oh, yeah. See how all these controls interact with one another. That's another reason why I don't often show it is swearing it tends to get involved at some point. Alright, so I've clearly messed up the vertical a bit, <laughs> and the horizontal's not quite right, but I just want to demonstrate what all those controls do. So now I need to hunker down and get a mirror out, and, uh, well, I uh, just happened to have gotten a new service mirror, a new old service mirror, at, uh, can't say radio, radio fast swap meet, so, turn off before I shock myself, here we go. It's actually just polished stainless steel, it's not uh, glass, which is a good thing. So we don't want to uh, break that. And, uh, yeah. Well, actually, before I make all those final settings on the set, I figure I better repair the mounting bracket for the spring that wraps around the CRT. And holds it down securely so the real common issue with these is this snaps off this early type of thermoset plastic uh, it's brittle um, and I'm not sure this is gonna hold but this is what I'm gonna try I very, very carefully drilled down the center of the one that broke off uh, I wanted to leave enough meat on there that it had some strength left, and there are some ribs on here which helps with that. And I'm going to put a screw down. I left the hole I drilled just slightly smaller than the threads. I'm going to heat this up and then drive it down before it cools down. And if it cools down a little bit, I can just uh, put a soldering iron or something on the end of this to heat it up and uh, continue to drive it down. I figured that was easy than, easier than tapping it. If I even have it tap, it's the right thread. I don't need to go down too far. I just want to make sure that it's sticking up about the same height as the remaining one. So it's going to stick up. The goal is about like that. And then the spring will hook into that. So grab a propane torch and a screwdriver and let's give this a try. Propane's overkill, but I figure since I have it handy, it's a quick and easy way to get this hot. Could use a lighter or a soldering iron, I'm sure. So, fires here. Heat it up a little bit.
really cool though. I think I got a little, got just a tad too hot. It was kind of melting the plastic more than I wanted to at first, but it quickly cooled down. And yeah, I think that. So now, <laughs> the question is, will that hold? solid now. But I'm not sure how much tension there is on that spring. Uh, we'll let's find out. Here it is mounted back in the set and this goes on like so. So just the question is can it hold up to the tension when the CRT is installed? Let's find out right now. Of course, always be very, 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 very careful when you do this. Uh, I can very clearly see where it had been. Uh, not that orientation makes any difference. In case you were wondering, with a round CRT, I do not need to put this in exactly as it was before. It doesn't matter. It's just handy to see those marks so I have an idea about where to position it. Although I think, I notice the mark, marks aren't symmetrical, so I think that that may have broken a long time ago. And the marks I'm seeing are from where it sat for years after the spring broke off. Oop, actually, I gotta take this back out because I was stupid. There is a little thing down below that holds this in place. Oh, I forgot to take it off, this guy. Collar back on this. Okay. There we go. Well, it's working. There's actually not as much tension on this as I thought there'd be. CRT, it's more secure than it was, but it's not totally locked into place. But, uh, yeah, well, there we go. So it's certainly a way to do it. Now I will proceed with making all those fiddly adjustments.